Hey, this is Brock Lemires. We're continuing our study of embedded systems design by looking at interrupts. In this video, we're going to talk about what the developer's responsibilities are. And we'll start with a summary of what happens uh, with when an IRQ happens. And it's important, this is just a, a quick recap of what goes on. And one, sometimes when you first start programming interrupts, it's kind of hard to understand what, what do I do as the developer versus what happens automatically for me? Because we kind of have this flow chart here that shows all the steps that happen when an interrupt occurs, but some of them are done by the CPU itself. And then some of them are done by you specifically. Okay. So let's just start at the beginning. <clears throat> first and foremost, an interrupt, let's, well, let's assume the interrupt is set up, okay? So the interrupt is configured and set up, and all of a sudden an event happens, some external event to the CPU, and a flag is raised. And so that means that an interrupt is now pending. The CPU always completes its current instruction so that it doesn't get interrupted during one of the critical states within the control unit state machine. Uh, so it completes the fetch, decode, execute cycle, and the reason that that's important is because when it returns to the top of the state machine, the program counter is pointing to the next instruction in the main program that is to be executed. That leaves the CPU in a state where it can, re it can stop, go do something else, and come back and pick up where it left off. Then it starts taking the step of executing the interrupt. So it is, go or the interrupt service team, it is going to push the program counter and the status register onto the stack. That preserves what is happening in the main program, and it allows the re service routine to return to the exact moment in the main program where it was interrupted. Then it clears the status register so that when it starts, so that the interrupt service routine has a fresh start. It also not only clears out all the flags, <clears throat> it also clears the global interrupt enable bit so that no other maskable interrupts are enabled and can interrupt that interrupt. Okay, so that's the default. Then what it does, it says, I'm ready to go start executing <clears throat> this interrupt service routine, but I don't know where it is. But I do know the vector address associated with the peripheral that caused this interrupt. So I will go down into the vector table retrieve the starting address of the interrupt service routine, put that into the program counter. Now the program counter is pointing at this first instruction in the interrupt service routine. It starts executing. Execute, 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 execute. At the, mo at the end of the interrupt service routine, it will see the RETI instruction, and that signifies to the CPU to go pop the status register and the program counter from the stack and what that does is it restores the prior state of the CPU when it was interrupted, and it puts the program counter back into the main loop where it can execute the next instruction in the program. And then in that way, the main program was not altered in any way, and the peripheral was handled. Okay, now we need to start thinking about what is the developer's responsibility. So what, is, what do you specifically do? Okay, first and foremost, if you're going to use a peripheral to generate an interrupt, the peripheral has to be configured. So you have to go out and learn about the peripheral. You have to open up the data sheets and the user's guides and figure out what you need to do to configure it so that it's active. If you think about a port, is the port going to be an input or an output? Is it going to have a resistor uh, on? Is it going to have a resistor enabled? Is the resistor going to be a pull up or pull down? You have to make sure that this thing is actually operational. Then you're going to start turning on the interrupt capability. It is always a good practice to first and foremost clear the peripheral's interrupt flag. Sometimes the flags are cleared for you by reset, but it's just a good practice. When this interrupt fires, when this peripheral is going to fire an interrupt, it is going to raise a flag. So go ahead and make sure that before you enter your main program loop, you ensure that that peripheral's interrupt flag, this is the local interrupt flag, is cleared. That way you know that you're starting fresh, okay? Then what you are gonna do is en start enabling the interrupt. So you have to actually assert the local interrupt enable for the peripheral. And this is gonna be a bit that is within the configuration registers that you learned about when you were setting up the peripheral. So all of these maskable interrupts that are tied to peripherals, 
have a local enable bit and you need to enable it. Then once you got that specific interrupt enable, you have to allow maskable interrupts. That means you have to assert the global interrupt enable in the status register. And so that's the instruction EINT, <clears throat> interrupt enable interrupts. So that turns on all maskable interrupts, except it just allows them to happen. Only the ones that have their local interrupt enable enabled will actually be able to raise a flag and be serviced by the CPU. So at this moment in time, you can think of the peripheral as being enabled for an interrupt and, and the CPU is accepting interrupts. You now need to go write an interrupt service routine. And when you do it, you're gonna you know, add your tasks in there, your opcodes and operands to do whatever you need to do when that peripheral fires. But two important things. First of all, you need to start it with an address label. You usually do this anyway when you think about a routine, but it becomes critical because that starting address is where we need to tell the program counter to go when the interrupt is serviced. So you're gonna start with an address label and then you end it with RETI, okay? So RETI, that is, that is important. Within the interrupt service routine, you gotta clear the local interrupt enable. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, you gotta clear the peripherals interrupt flag. Because remember, once you got to this interrupt service routine, the peripheral interrupt flag was asserted. So you, if you want this to be able to fire again, which you do, you gotta clear it. So there's kind of three housekeeping tasks within the interrupt service routine, separate from the actual functionality. You gotta give it an address label as a starting address, you gotta clear the peripherals interrupt flag, and then you gotta end it with RETI, okay? Now that you have your interrupt service routine, you need to put the starting address in the vector table associated with your peripheral. So you are gonna initialize the vector address for the peripheral and you do it with assembler directives. Remember, you're gonna do a dot sect and then go to the apps, the hard coded address for the vector associated with its peripheral. And that's, you know, that's given by the linker file and it's in the table that I've shown you a couple times. And then you need to drop in using the dot short, the address of the start, okay? The starting address of the interrupt service routine. So that's where you're gonna do a dot short and then you put the label. Okay, that's it. That's the overview of what happens during an interrupt and what is your responsibility as the developer. All right, as always, support my channel by subscribing and see ya.